Now, um, first, I, I want to start off with, um, as I know, know a bit about Keynes, I want to say, ask the question, what would Keynes uh, think of the Eurozone? Um, I've often asked, been asked whether he would be a Europhile or a Europhobe. Um, what would he have voted to remain or leave the EU? Um, it's a question which is very hard to answer, actually, because while he would have endorsed and applauded the political aim, <coughs> aim of the European Union, he would have strongly disapproved of the economic doctrines on which it was based. Um, prominent Keynesians like Nicholas Caldor were very hostile to Britain joining the EU in the 1970s, um, precisely on this ground. And um, Keynes's doubts would have been strengthened by the way the single currency area was set up. He would have seen it as a new gold standard, even more rigid than the original one. He would have said that monetary union was established on the wrong economic principles. Until this was acknowledged, there could be no decisive improvement in policy tools. And that's going to be the theme of what I want to say. Today, it's not enough to say that what the European Union, uh, Eurozone requires is a state, which, although lots of people have made that argument. We have to say what we think such a state would do. A neoliberal state will not do what needs to be done to make monetary union a success. In fact, an important purpose in setting up the monetary union was to deprive national states of their traditional fiscal and monetary instruments which they were said to abuse without replacing them by euro-wide instruments. Now, I, I hope I give, well, this is just the structure of, of the presentation. Um, no, that's come in the wrong place. Here we are. We can, this is what I want. Um, so long as no member state is allowed to finance a budget. The what? OK. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so long as no member state is allowed to finance a budget deficit by simply printing money, nor borrow on the credit of the taxpayer of other member states, then we shouldn't need any more binding, any more binding rules than that. And that was a common view in 1989, Vice President of the European Commission. Um, uh, so the future of the Eurozone is bound up with the future of macroeconomics and macroeconomic policy. It involves not just the future scope of macro policy, but the way monetary, fiscal, and financial policy are coordinated. I have an uneasy feeling when people say, well, these are the reforms that are necessary. The, this is what we must do. We must strengthen this. We must have this and that and the other, without actually um, investigating how far current theory supports these reforms. Um, because if it doesn't, they will be botched. It's not just a matter of political will. They won't happen. Um, so I think the whole analysis needs to be recast a bit and um, uh, it, towards a more fundamental uh, set of questions. Now, the design flaws, the design flaws of the uh, monetary union were evident to Keynesians from the start. They emphasized three, the lack of a fiscal transfer mechanism, deal with asymmetric shocks, the lack of a contra-cyclical fiscal capacity, and a single target central bank accountable to no one, kind of Vatican City that sort of was sort of floated above any democracy or legitimacy, really. Well, just some legitimacy it had, sorry. From, and this design reflected a confluence of two economic orthodoxies, I'd say. From the United States, and rapidly taking over the Anglo-American economics profession, was Milton Friedman's monetarism, the view that the only macro policy needed was to control inflation, and provided this was done, economies would be cyclically stable at their natural rate of unemployment. A view, incidentally, going right back to David Hume. So, you know, this is progress in economics. The other input was German, the Bundesbank's obsessive anti-inflationism plus ordo-liberalism. I mean, I distinguish ordo-liberalism from the social market economy. I think one should, of course, but a lot of people confuse them, uh, sort of put them together. Um, and and, and I, I don't think, I don't think, um, I think they're quite separate. Um, now, um, so 
in, the Eurozone then was set up in conscious and deliberate rejection of the Keynesian fiscal and monetary constitution. Now, Keynes, what is Keynes's message? Um, Keynes in economics, macroeconomics, of course, rests on the insufficiency of demand, not inefficiency of supply. Deficiency of demand, not inefficiency of supply. This was manifested, this deficiency in the existence of involuntary unemployment and unused productive capacity. In the Keynesian model, investment may fall short of ex-ante saving. The interest rate was the price of money, not the price of saving. Hence, it could not equilibrate the two. Equilibration was achieved by changes, falls in output and employment. So, you know, the slogan was quantities adjust not prices, leading to the possibility of underemployment equilibrium. Underemployment equilibrium is key, absolutely key um, in Keynesian economics. Keynes assumed that suboptimal equilibrium was a normal or chronic feature of capitalist economies interrupted by moments of excitement. Um, got to consider what we mean by normal. The term normal uh, is, is banded around. It's one of, these, one of these pivots of conflict in macroeconomics. What do we mean by normal? Um, so a permanent program of public investment was required to plug the, 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 uh, the, the deflationary gap. If this proved insufficient to um, uh, uh, prevent downturns, then governments should run budget deficits to restore full employment. Now, that's the, you know, everyone knows this. Now, Keynes's vision, this is a, perhaps a bit more, we come to something more interesting in a way. Keynes's vision, to use Schumpeter's term, was rooted in his epistemology. To get Keynes, you have to read the treatise on probability. And no one does, so therefore no one gets Keynes. A few, a few people sort of know what the gist of it was and how the epistemology linked up to the Keynesian model and the ways in which it linked up. But very few people do this, this work. And it may, you know, some people say it's not worth doing. We've gone far beyond that. We, we now have mathematical expectations. We don't need all this um, um, uh, old, old, old stuff about probability. But the key distinction Keynes made was between calculable or actuarial risk and uncertainty, a distinction which has long since been obliterated in not only in the fina financial journalism, but actually in financial economics. The most common word in financial literature is risk. I wonder how, you know, if you do one of those graphs, I'm sure the, citate, the use of the word risk has just exploded in the last seven or eight years. Everyone is talking about risk, risk management, risk profiles, risk premium, and they're completely as though, as though these things were, were, were you know, um, uh, 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 as though the full range of probability distributions for all conceivable futures was known. Um, as though the game of life was like a game of dice. Um, uh, whereas Keynes thought that mathematical expectations were only to be had in small fractions of cases, a flavor of his treatment from the treatise on probability is, I think, in the crude list. Um, I, um, I point to the word caprice. And it's the pretense of mathematical probability um, which um, actually, in Keynes's view, uh, produces the um, lack of foresight um, in, in economic policy because the, the policymakers and the theorists think they know. This was obviously true of bank, of bank mathematical models. It was true of the central bank's mathematical models. They know, they pretend to know. 
and it's the pretense of knowing that causes the trouble. If you weren't so, if the pretense wasn't so um, um, overwhelming, um, better precautions would be taken. Um, so that is um, um, Keynes's um, uh, um, take on probability. <clears throat> now, the prevalence of uncertainty, not probability, gives rise to liquidity preference, which determines a role for money which has been largely ignored by the mainstream for, uh, from Adam Smith onwards. In, in, it, it's, it's summed up in his rejection of the classical dichotomy. Now, I wonder whether I've got that. Oh, yeah. This is from Keynes' is A Monetary Theory of Production. It's worth reading. Again, one of those writings that very few people know about. Money, that is to say, is employed, but is treated as being in some sense neutral. Now, where did we just recently, five minutes ago, get that phrase about the neutral rate of interest, the real neutral rate of interest, cited, I think, by Nicol, is it uh, from a Summers paper of 2009? Then the neutral rate of interest may, you know, be minus X. This, is, this goes all the way back to the muddles of Bixell. I mean, another example of wonderful progress in economic thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I think they can hear me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the, the second paragraph is uh, also... In other words... In other words... Um, one of the operative factors in this situation is that the course of events cannot be predicted without a knowledge of the behavior of money between the first state of affairs and the second. That's what I mean when we talk of a monetary economy. Um, Keynes's analysis of the inherent underperformance of unmanaged economies has a huge implication for the role of the state. If market economies had no, have no natural tendency to full employment, it fell to governments to ensure enough demand in the economy to do so. In the Keynesian economy, the role of monetary policy is to ensure permanently low rates of interest. In other words, to prevent usury, a word that he was not shy of using, um, and, and um, a, a balanced budget would be an achievement and not a cause of full employment. Contrary to New Keynesian fiscal, uh, contrary to New Keynesianism, fiscal policy was a necessary condition of full employment, not something to be confined to an emergency. You know, again, current discourse is very misleading about this. Yes, when we're in a hole, well, where's fiscal policy? Central banks say we haven't got enough fiscal policy. We can't do the job all on our own. I mean, that's nothing to do with Keynes. I mean, Keynes. Fiscal policy has a permanent role in, in Keynes's thinking in maintaining a full employment level of, 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 of output and income. In other words, I go back to the point I made that Keynes and the neoclassicals have a very um, different idea of what the word normal means. <clears throat> um, and the just a digression, I think, but a digression that I think is very important because it's part of the explanation of why demand may fall short of a supply and why Say's law may not hold, and that is Karl Marx's view. I mean, in, in contrast to Keynes's epistemic explanation of deficiency of aggregate demand, with, with Karl Marx has a structural explanation. Um, because in, in Marxist theory, slumps arise from a disproportion between the growth of output and the demand for consumption goods, a disproportion rooted in exploitation. Exploitation, which means paying workers less than they produce, was needed for profit, but it left workers unable to buy all they had produced. All they had produced. This was capitalism's great contradiction. And Marx says, I quote, the last cause of all real crises has is all, always remains the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses as compared to the tendency of capitalist production to develop the productive forces. Now, I think the two explanations need to be combined, actually, and I think they both have their role to play, and one points to, you know, 
a demand, uh, a, a, um, a, a public investment to maintain demand, and the other points to redistribution of wealth and incomes in order to get enough consumption power to sustain um, the, the, the uh, productive capacity of the economy. Now, there's another point, and before I get to um, what, what needs to be done, um, the saving investment imbalance, which underlies uh, Keynes's thought, um, uh, can be ex uh, explained not just in terms of the maldistribution of wealth and income, but also uh, within a closed economy, but also um, it, it, it can be approached in terms of a geographical imbalance between different countries or regions. In fact, Keynes himself has precisely such international imbalances in mind in his analysis of the failure of the gold standard in the interwar years, and that's very, very relevant to what's going on in the Eurozone. The following passage from his um, International Clearing Union proposal. It's quite a long passage, but I think it's terribly important because I think it brings out very clearly the nature of the adjustment problem in the Eurozone today. And we haven't got the mechanism that he proposed to deal with that. Um, it's characteristic of a freely convertible international standard that throws the main burden of adjustment on the country which is in the debtor position on the international balance of payments. That is on the country, which is by hypothesis the weaker and above all the smaller. Then he says, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the, classical, the classical theory assumes that all this is going to adjust naturally. But even to the extent that this holds good, the contribution in terms of the resulting social strain, which the debtor country has to make to, uh, uh, to the restoration of equilibrium by changing its prices and wages, is altogether out of proportion to the contribution asked of its creditors. Uh, so the strain of an adjustment downwards is much greater than the strain of an adjustment upwards. And besides this, the process of adjustment is compulsory for the debtor uh, and voluntary for the creditor. If the creditor doesn't choose to make or allow his share of the adjustment, he suffers no inconvenience. But whilst the country's reserve cannot fall below zero, there is no ceiling which sets an upper limit. The same is true if international loans are to be the means of adjustment. The debtor must borrow. The creditor is under no such compulsion. Well, what Keynes uh, said is under no compulsion to lend. Um, now, then he talks about this, the fact that when the gold standard system disintegrated, you not only had a secession of loans from the creditor to the debtor, but a reverse uh, movement of capital from the debtor to the creditor. And, you know, we have no security against a repetition of this after the present war. Now, all of that, we have to relearn again. Now, people talk about, oh, well, we need, a, we need a European monetary fund. You know, that's one of the proposals. Well, what's the theory behind it? Is, is it accepted that the creditor needs to be a major part of the process of adjustment? Yes or no? Um, I, I don't think the Germans agree with that at all. And they are the main, they're the most important um, member of, 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 um, uh, uh, in the European Union, the, the most powerful country. So, um, let me um, now go on to my conclusion. I think, how many more minutes have I got? Uh, five more minutes. Oh, okay, <laughs> plenty of time. Is that for 20 minutes or 25 minutes? I've had about 20 minutes. Terrible. Um, so what's to be done? All the papers on the euro I've listened to at this conference, and they've been really very interesting, and I've learned a lot, uh, converge on this question that have largely echoed Professor Paul de Groy's anguished cry of 2016. One is one to despair, the other is to say, yes, it will be very difficult, and the chances of success are slim, but let's try anyway. Uh, that's something, I, I, it recall, reminds me of a phrase by Gramsci, wasn't it? Optimism of reason, pessimism of will. I don't, I, 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 <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, everyone thought the Euro, Eurozone would break up in 2011, or indeed most economists did. Then Draghi stepped in and preserved it. Um, so, um, now, two, two questions. 
what will it take, uh, if the question, what will it take for the Eurozone to survive another 20 years? Two um, sort of um, opposites here. One is it needs a state. Um, number 10, yeah one, one, yeah. one thing is it needs a state. And Jamie Galbraith has been, many economists have argued this exactly. It needs a state. Unfortunately, there's no possibility of a state. Um, there, there's a variant. There's a variant on the Eurozone needs a state view, which is... Um, uh, 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 which seeks to explain how the old gold standard provided, um, how the old gold standard functioned without a sovereign. Um, it, it introduces the idea of the underwriter. And Charles Kindleberger has argued that um, uh, when it worked well, the gold standard was managed by a surrogate state. I mean, that's the, he called it a hegemon. And um, the hegemon in the 19th century was Britain, and the hegemon in, in the period of the, when the Bretton Woods system was working uh, well was the United States. And really, um, what Kindleberger does, his hegemonic thesis, draws on the insights of Mansa Olson to explain how public goods might be provided in the absence of a state. It's a very, very, a very, very insightful a line of, of argument. Um, and what the hegemon has to do in order to, um, so, uh, so that the public goods of an international community um, can be maintained, are to offer what um, uh, he calls sweeteners or special incentives uh, to induce other members of the club to follow the rules. Um, the special incentives are loans on easy terms and, 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 and in, in a in, on predictable, uh, in a predictable way, imports free of tariffs, and discounting in crisis. That was the third, third element, sweetener. The hegemon has to be prepared to discount in crisis. Uh, Germany, Europe's de facto hegemon, has satisfied two of these conditions, free imports and foreign lending, but failed to discount debtors' redundant paper, provide cheap credit at the moment when it was needed. There was a delay of two or three years, and that delay accounts for the di difference between the performance of the United States post-2008 and that of the European Union. Now, the opposite of, of uh, a state or a hegemon is breakup, and that was, uh, uh, that was um, uh, proposed by, really, it was the idea of uh, Wolfgang Schobel, German fine finance minister. He's often argued for this. He says the Eurozone is too large to be successful. It can't be governed. It should shrink and there should be two, two groups, one that can maintain a common currency and the other that has, you know, allowed to do what it wants, more or less. Um, and and that, that is a perfectly logical um, um, uh, uh, view. It's really, um, in essence, uh, Schäuble's propositions hark back uh, to the debate between the greater Germany dreamt of by the idealists in 1848 and the smaller Germany created by Bismarck in 1871. I, I did history, see, so I, these things come to mind. So, uh, however, as is always the case with simple models, the binary opposition between statehood and breaking up is too sharp. sharp. There are lots of intermediate positions. You can creep towards, you know, creep towards one or creep towards the other. Um, and um, maybe, maybe the Eurozone will be able to muddle through. But you see, I, 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 rather than go through all the things that have already been gone through by previous speakers, let me end by, um, uh, uh, with a conclusion. Important though institution building is, I have an uneasy feeling that the analysis of the Eurozone in terms of inadequate institutions starts in the wrong place. Institutions serve purposes, and we need to attain to a much greater clarity concerning what we want from our institutions uh, before we um, think about how the institutions may be reformed. It's not so much the weakness of political will which highlights the survival prospects of the Eurozone as the weakness of current economics. So, questions. Why do we need macroeconomics? This is the fundamental question. Macroeconomics is in a total mess. Um, as, as these phrases from fragments of earlier, uh, earlier thought, like um, uh, neutral real interest rates, show. So, I mean, 
We don't need macroeconomics, according to the Chicago School. Microeconomics can do everything that's required. All we need is control of the value of money, and the rest will follow. Now, now of course, New Keynesians you know, don't quite agree with that, but in a modified way, that has been so much the mainstream um, uh, 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 view of the economic world. Assuming some macroeconomic policy is needed, should it be confined to monetary policy? Does fiscal policy have a part to play? Uh, or, or should it be confined to microeconomics? Yep, I've only got three more points. So very, very short. Um, uh, yeah, um, now, um, uh, so if you, if you decide you need fiscal policy, how do you avoid the main faults of fiscal policy as they developed in the 1960s and 70s, mistiming the business cycle and vote-catching politicians? How do you avoid that? That's a big problem, and it's got to be sorted out. I would have an automatic fiscal policy of some kind, which uh, minimized the di political discretion. Um, how, uh, another point, how should fiscal and monetary policy be coordinated? Who is accountable to whom for what? Does financial stability require restriction on the free movement of capital? I believe it does. I think all these schemes for separating, you know, I mean, um, uh, 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 Professor uh, Arestes is very interesting talk this morning, separate out you know, investment banking from retail banking. They're all very, very good, but I think you need something much, I think you just need to attack the fetish of a freedom of, of, of capital to roam the world and cause efficiency and destruction in equal proportions, perhaps, wherever it goes. And then Fifth point, what is the trade-off between efficiency and macroeconomic stability? And finally, political economy question, what is, what's the trade-off between economic efficiency and political stability? The Danny Roderick dilemma. So this is the terrain on which I believe the battle over the euro will have to be fought. Its prospects of survival depend on the way it's resolved. Thank you.